Most of us would probably say we'd like to be more intelligent, that it'd be cool to be a genius. But the problem is that most of us would probably also struggle to define exactly what intelligence or genius are. So defining intelligence as a high IQ is a somewhat arbitrary and imperfect measure. You can have a low IQ and still be very intelligent in a lot of different ways, and that's really the problem. It seems that there's lots of different forms of intelligence. So this is a modular view of intelligence. That's saying that you have lots of different kinds of intelligence, lots of different brain areas, responsible for lots of different processes in the brain, and you can be good at one and not so good at another. One of the most famous theories that goes down this route is Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. So Howard Gardner was a psychologist who said that intelligence should be broken down into several different categories, and he described these as musical rhythmic, visual spatial, verbal linguistic, logical mathematical, bodily kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and naturalistic. So basically he's saying that you could be great in your linguistic intelligence, but not so great in your mathematical intelligence. And indeed, we all know people like this who might not be so good at maths, but that doesn't mean that they're dumb because they're great at speaking, they're witty, they're well-read, etc. Later on, Garden would also go on to add moralistic intelligence, and existential intelligence to that list. So while there is some biological basis for this argument, I find that Gardner's examples in particular are somewhat arbitrary and random, and I can't really understand why they're given as much credit as they are. I mean, why do we have intrapersonal and interpersonal as separate categories of intelligence when surely there's a huge overlap between those skills, likewise for linguistic. But that's not to say that a modular view is useless and there is quite a lot of research backing up this approach. To begin with, we know that there's a distinction between fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. So fluid intelligence is your dynamic intelligence, your ability to perform maths, answer um, reasoning problems. And then crystallized intelligence is your knowledge, the amount of information you have stored. These are both useful, but they're completely different skills. Normally, when we talk about intelligence, we're talking about fluid intelligence. And that's what IQ scores represent uh, more so than crystallized intelligence. And what also backs us up, of course, is the simple fact that the brain is generally structured in that way, it's divided into different areas, different clusters of neurons, which perform specific activities and functions. So you have your broker's area for language, you have the intraparietal sulcus for math, you have your motor cortex for movement, all these different things. And so it does make sense that one area could be bigger than the other or more used than the other, because the brain is organized in that way. And in keeping with this is the fact that brain damage to specific areas can result in very domain specific deficits in terms of cognitive performance. So one example of this is prosopagnosia, and this is a condition where people have damage to either the occipital face area or the fusiform face areas in the brain, and this results in their inability to recognize faces. So they're perfectly intelligent, they can see just fine, but they can't recognize their friends and they can't tell people apart. And that shows how in theory you can be completely fine, very bright, but if one brain area is poor, then you're gonna have poor performance in that one specific domain. But more interesting still is that there is some negative correlation between these different types of intelligence. So if you're really good at one, you're actually likely to be slightly worse at the other. So if you're really good at maths, then statistically you're more likely to be slightly worse at language. That's not always the case, but it's often the case. Uh, this is why we get um, late speakers becoming engineers and mathematicians, why a lot of people with dyslexia go on to do maths and engineering. Uh, Einstein was a late speaker. This can also explain the nutty professor kind of type, someone who's uh, great at philosophy and science and maths, always in their own head, coming up with new ideas, but at the same time, they're not so good at remembering where their keys were, they don't have great interpersonal skills. And from a biological perspective, it seems that these types of people have fewer D2 dopamine receptors in the thalamus, so we can actually demonstrate this by looking at their brains. What's even more interesting in this regard is autistic savantism. So an uh, autistic savant is someone who uh, has autism, that's, that's poor interpersonal skills, but they are extremely gifted in a particular area. And now not all of all autistic people have savantism. That's definitely a misconception, a myth. Most don't, but there are a few exceptions. People who can perfectly draw a city scene after just seeing it once, or people who are capable of uh, doing incredible math, telling you what day you were born on, um, but then they struggle with social interaction. And in one study, it was found that by using transcranial magnetic stimulation to suppress the language and interpersonal areas of a healthy regular brain, it was possible to improve abilities in maths. So to induce um, autistic savantism seemingly in regular participants 
by stimulating their brains through their scalps with magnetism. So by shutting down one brain area temporarily, another area gets a temporary boost, which is fascinating and has a ton of transhuman and nootropic potential. And interestingly, this also kind of throws out some of the explanations as to why this might be the case, why we might have uh, better abilities in some areas than others. Because obviously you would say that if someone's bad at maths, then they're gonna spend more time learning and focusing on English. If someone's great at art, they're gonna do that more and they might neglect other aspects of their life. So of course, you're gonna likely have uh, people who have specific skills in one modality rather than jack of all trades on the whole. But by saying that when you suppress one brain area, another instantly improves in performance, you're kind of also saying there's a kind of resource management thing going on here where, where maybe one's interfering with the other or one's stealing energy from the other. And if you remove it, then the other one gets better. And of course, we all know that blind people generally have better senses. The brain has a whole um, history of compensating for deficits in different areas and this can be achieved in the long term via brain plasticity. So there's all sorts of reasons why this might be the case but in short suppressing ability in one cognitive faculty might improve your ability in another. But this might not seem like a very satisfactory answer because we all know people in life who just seem generally brainy like they have great overall intelligence, they're great at speaking, they're great at maths, they're witty in conversation, they're always immaculately presented, charming and frustrating. Then we've got other people who might be better in one area than another and we have people who are just lost causes really. So why is it that if intelligence is all down to categories and you can't have one person being overall better at everything, why is it that we think of some people as intelligent and other people as not so intelligent? Well this could come down to global brain connectivity which is the amount of connectivity between the different brain areas. And I said earlier that Einstein was someone who seemed to have a very specialized brain. He was a late speaker and he's very good at maths and visual spatial reasoning and physics, but actually he also had a very thick corpus callosum, which is a, a bundle of neurons that connects the left and right hemispheres of the brain and allows crosstalk between them. And when we think of someone who's very skilled at something, we think of someone who's able to accomplish a skill quickly, efficiently, and with confidence. And this comes down to rote learning, which develops the plasticity in the area, it builds the neural connections, so that you have these neural pathways for specific activities and you don't even have to think about it. Your fingers just do the playing on the keyboard or you just quickly answer that maths question. But we think of genius more in terms of creativity, in terms of shifting paradigms, coming up with new ideas. And this comes down to our ability to take two separate ideas and combine them into a unique new idea, a unique new solution. They say that there's no such thing as creativity. Creativity is the combination of two existent ideas. So if you have more global brain connectivity between different brain regions, you can bring in your maths reasoning and your visual spatial reasoning and your linguistic skill and your interpersonal knowledge all into this one cohesive thought or idea. And that's more likely to result in something that we would consider genius than just having a very developed brain area through rote practice in one particular skill. And we tend to use our brain areas in this way cohesively altogether. We don't, you never just do maths in the real world, do you? You're, you're constantly predicting what's gonna happen, you're remembering things, you're speaking to people, you're moving through space all at once. We have to use everything all together and bring all this information in to a cohesive whole. And backing this theory up are plenty of studies that do show that global brain connectivity is correlated with high IQ scores. Also correlated with IQ is just gray matter, the weight of your brain, the amount of neurons in your brain. The more neurons you have, the more they're connected, the smarter you seem to be, the heavier your brain, the smarter you seem to be. So why is it that some people are smarter than others? How did they get that way? Can you get that way? Well, if we look at it like this, you have all these different brain areas. Each one can be better or worse depending on the amount of size it has, the amount of neural matter in it. Then you have the amount of connectivity between those brain areas, and then you have the amount of weight that all of this adds up to. Well, that's brain plasticity. It's the ability of the brain to grow and adapt to change, to form new neural connections, to birth new neurons, so the more plastic your brain is, the more it's able to grow and adapt to its environment, the more intelligent you'll become, given the training, given the opportunity, given the stimulus. So it really comes down to plasticity plus opportunity. So if you're innately highly plastic because you have the right neural chemical combination, and then you're put through a great education system, or you're just someone who's very interested yourself, and you go out there and you challenge yourself and learn new things, then your brain will be highly plastic, it will grow, you'll learn lots of things, you'll use all your different brain areas, you'll use them together, and your brain will end up thick and big as you develop, and you'll be more intelligent as a result. 
higher general plasticity will have greater development in specific brain areas that we think of as important for intelligence and they'll also have greater connectivity between those areas just because they'll form new connections more easily and overall the density of their brain will be greater. That explains why you'll have these people who seem to be great at everything and also great at coming up with new insights and ideas by combining different types of intelligence across their entire brain. So these people that we think of as just super smart are probably actually super plastic. Stanley clearly knew this in the 60s, which is why he gave us Mr. Fantastic. So our brains are most highly plastic, of course, in infancy as we're developing, as we're growing. And that's why if you give a child all the right nutrition, the right sleep, the right exercise, and then you give them the right education and stimulation, they'll grow up to be highly intelligent adults. Fortunately, there are lots of ways we can increase plasticity in adulthood, so it's not too late for you. It's something I talk about a lot on this channel and on the website. I will do a video dedicated soon to increasing plasticity, but just some key tips, exercise more, sleep more, and most importantly, learn, expose yourself to new stimulus because the brain reacts to the opportunity to learn by becoming better at learning, use it or lose it. If you wanna become highly plastic, then seek out new opportunities, new experiences, and your brain will become more awash with dopamine and BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. The bottom line is that to me at least, intelligence is adaptability. So if you found this video useful and interesting guys, if you did, then please leave a like, please comment down below. The channel is gaining a lot of traction lately and it's all thanks to you guys. I'm loving the conversations we're having down below and yeah, I really appreciate it. Of course, subscribe if you wanna see more like this and hit the bell button if you wanna get notified of each new video. Lots of videos coming up in future on all the usual stuff, brain training, bodybuilding, fitness, performance, technology, productivity. So if that sounds good, then stay tuned and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching and bye for now.